Welcome. Frequency mode. Hello there. Welcome to the wonderful world of radio frequency and electronics engineering. On the bench today for review are two um, Radtel radios. Uh, these are straight out of China. The model number is RT470Xs. Uh, these radios came to me fairly recently. I've been doing a bit of testing with them um, from a friend of mine who bought one initially and recommended uh, them to me. So I decided I'd make the purchase of two of these radios so we can test them back to back. So what we're going to do in this video really, it's quite an in-depth video on these radios. Um, we're going to go and look at them in depth on the Marconi radio test set as well as the HP Agilent uh, ESA spectrum analyzer later in the video where we're going to test the receiver sensitivity, the transmit power. We're also going to do a comprehensive a harmonic analysis of a transmitter on both radios. Um, now those who are familiar with Bofang radios, particularly the Bofang UV5R, which I'm absolutely certain these are from the same factory. Uh, very similar in appearance, very similar functional layout. Uh, again, very, very familiar and similar product range. So I've got a funny feeling, and there's a spoiler alert coming up in this video as well, um, about the harmonic output on these radios being obviously... Um, a little bit naughty maybe on certain frequencies so we'll we'll look at that on the spectrum analyzer uh, on the radio test set as well as the ESA um, in this video as well not only do we strip the radio apart and have a look inside at its internals and and see how it's made and constructed but we also go into full comprehensive testing and measurement of all the harmonic spurious emissions coming out and I'll show you how to do that on the ESA spectrum analyzer as well and we'll look at harmonic analysis, the power levels, and compare that against type approval as well. So we'll get into it, um, but what we'll also do is we'll have a look at the radio in depth and its menus, its functional capability. I think one of the first things that I can certainly say about the radio is it's got an exceptionally clear display, and it's one of the best radios that I've had in a long time where the display is so clear. Um, I think it's an OLED display, but it's really good, even in bright light conditions um, so anybody out there who's got a disability with regard to eyesight where they've got failing eyesight or poor eyesight you know um, this radio as far as I'm concerned is really good because the text height the colors of the display the contrast and everything all make it ideally presentable for somebody with um, eyesight issues as well as that, the radio talks to you as well. So when you actually um, press a, a button, for example, Four, uh, you know, five, three, you eight, know, it's zero, physically telling zero. you <clears throat> what it's doing. You know, and obviously, if you go into scan mode, it tells you when the scanning begins and obviously when the scanning, scanning ends. Stop. It, when you go into menu, menu as well and all the different facilities within Hunt. that, you know, you can go up and down and change the scroll Confirm. settings do all sorts of different things so it's, it's really quite good uh, for, for, for disabled users I think it's really very good um, it's quite rugged as well um, I'd say ideally if it was used outside it's probably rainproof splash proof to some degree um, it's very robust in construction it's not cheap sort of plasticky construction it's, uh, it's like ABS plastic um, on top we've got a nice torch uh, LED as well so when we we press the um, side button there we get uh, either a con continuous torch which is quite bright you know it's very very bright because the lights in here are quite bright and it can also flash as well we've got music radio which I'm going to go into in a second but then you can get the the LED to flash or off or constant you know obviously for the torch so it's got a little torch inbuilt and as you've just heard there as well when you press this button here then you can get music radio you know the broadcast band uh, can come on now again um, nine I think that is uh, 90 oh, 93.7 Tennis in the women's world number one Arena this Sabalenka right. beat the fourth seed Yelena Rebekina in three really sets good, you know. the last four of the end of season Now, nice thing about this uh, 
broadcast receiver is of course as low as about 68 megahertz I think it is 66 megahertz in the spec and um, that means that potentially you can listen to 4 meter amateur band on it as well on 70 megahertz which is although it would be in wide FM mode it can still be heard the signal and we'll look at that later as well in the um, in the test that we'll be doing on the Marconi radio test set and Another nice little feature that I like about this radio as well is you can program these buttons to do anything that you want on long press or short press. So it's got the torch, it's got the broadcast radio that we can we can hear there. Uh, and as I said, for, for me, time to band, I could put in 70, 70, 400. So it's now on 70.4 megahertz and that'll be receiving the for me, time to band calling frequency. Um, so that's quite good. So it's got the music radio, the torch that we've looked at. It's also got the weather channel if you're in the United States, the NOAA weather channel. So if you press the orange button on the top, then it becomes a weather channel. Now, the orange button has also got a panic mode feature. So if you press and hold it, you know, it can send a, a panic mode out. Um, the LED at the top there, when you're transmitting, goes red. And when it's receiving it goes green um, the volume is quite loud on the radio as well and one of the nice features of the radio which I quite like is it's got a standard SMA socket in the top uh, and the nice thing about that is so many of these new radios these days have got the reverse polarity SMA which is very annoying especially when you're trying to get RF adapters where the pin would be in the, in the antenna and the receptacle so, um, female would be in the in the socket it's so difficult to get RF adapters that uh, are for that gender so it's nice that it's got a proper SMA connector on the top as well so it makes it easy to adapt to external antennas things like that uh, now the battery pack on the rear has got a charging socket at the bottom which is a USB and it can plug into any USB charger and when it's charging there's a little LED just here where my fingernail is and that will go red when it's charging and green when it's complete with its charging. Now, its construction is quite sturdy. I think it's based on like a Motorola GP900 um, or 300, quite a tough uh, diecast alloy back. And, um, you know, there's some similarities there, I think, with Motorola product actually, uh, with the way that it looks. But the the battery itself is a 2.6 amp per hour, 2,600 milliamp per hour cell, um, which gives it some reasonable battery life. I mean, its standby battery life is very good. I've had these radios on all night sometimes and come back to them the following morning and they've been still charged up. Uh, transmit time, I don't think it's too lengthy on them because they are a bit greedy on current when you're transmitting. Um, so obviously the battery life might not be as good on long transmissions uh, okay on short messages um, but on long transmissions maybe a little bit um, quick with the battery run down with it only being 2.6 amp per hour but <clears throat> this radio does boast a very wide frequency coverage so not only does the broadcast band uh, button allow us to tune between effectively um, 60 something megahertz right up to 108 megahertz which is the international broadcast band um, but also yes it's 66 to 108 megahertz but also it has the aircraft band on it as well um, for listening to aviation so and it's AM receive so I could put in say um, uh, 118 for example five zero zero and now we're on aircraft uh, receive and obviously you can start scanning can as well begin? and see if it picks up any aircraft uh, radio frequencies so that's really good as well I quite like that feature and I'll just stop that now scanning stop. Uh, and then on top of that we've got a very wide transmit receive frequency range on the radio from 136 to 180 megahertz so if we put any frequency in between 136 to 180 megahertz, we can transmit as well as receive. And 200 to 260 megahertz. 
again for countries like the United States where they have another amateur band allocation in in that frequency range and on UHF it transmits from 400 to 520 megahertz um, but it also transmits at 350 to 400 megahertz as well transmits and receives so it's got such a wide frequency band uh, coverage for transmit receive so the military air band um, although it would receive in FM on those frequencies but it's got the civil aviation air band 108 to 136 it's obviously got that for AM it's got the FM broadcast receiver from 66 to 108 plus all the other stuff that we've just looked at there so it's very very uh, wide frequency range uh, as you can see so really really good um, insofar as that's concerned you can also have a channel mode so you can uh, if you move the cursor to the top frequency display and press and hold this channel then mode. you can get it into channels Two, three, four, five, six, seven. so that's also quite a useful feature as well as having the VFO mode as well uh, well, obviously, One, four, five, five, zero, zero. and you can program the steps. It's got CTCSS, DTMF, DCS. It's even got a voice scrambler on it as well for speech inversion, I believe. So we'll have a look at that a bit later. And um, quite a lot of stuff in the menu. You can program it with um, the programming software and lead that you can buy. And also, there's a remote speaker microphone that can plug into this side connector here. Um, when I can get this cover off so that plugs in there now although the battery is designed so that it can slot into a charger and this is why it's got these battery contacts there I don't have that and that doesn't come in the box all you get in the box is like a USB lead uh, a battery charger and a belt clip because there's a belt clip can go there and that all comes in the box um, so as I say you, you do get some accessories with it but um, you don't get like a, a proper docking battery charger, shall we say. Now, I do like the radio. It's quite a nice radio. It's fully featured, obviously. It's, its price point is reasonable. It's around about £30. Anywhere between, I've seen them retail at £20 up to about £60, depending on where you get them from. Um, and, of course, you get the little manual with it as well. It is a bit in pidgin English, I must admit with a Chinese translation to English uh, but I think there's about 56 menu items in total um, that you can go through and I believe as well a friend of mine told me although I'm going to have to verify this that it's got a near field frequency counter in it as well so that if you were um, near a transmitter you could enable a feature on it that will then turn it into a frequency counter and it will display the frequency of the near field transmission on the display um, but I must admit I haven't seen that in the in the menu yet, which we'll go through as part of this video. Uh, but all in all, quite a nice little radio, very handy, I'd say, for an SHTF prepper or somebody into survivalist uh, use, camping, things like that. A really good radio for that. Uh, obviously it transmits at, according to the specification at 5 watts um, on both VHF as well as UHF. Um, so it's got so many things that um, that it's it's particularly good at, at doing, um, and as I say, fully featured. Now, I think because it's Chinese, obviously the quality and everything will be an issue, as we've seen with the Bofang radios. And naturally, when we're using radios like this in countries where type approval exists. And we've, you know, we've obviously got to bear in mind the legal limits for spurious emissions. Then naturally, um, you know, that's why we need to measure those characteristics on the test gear that we've got, because a lot of the gear that comes out of China, I'm afraid, doesn't meet European or FCC rules. And um, unfortunately, if you were using this type of equipment in situations where uh, the equipment can emit too much spurious emissions on other frequencies that it's not meant to be transmitting on the harmonic frequencies 
then it can cause interference to the radio communication services. So that's what we're going to look at as part of this video and I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Okay, so we'll have a look at the menu structure now and then we'll move, progress to doing some radio testing. Okay, so we'll have a look at the menu and uh, we'll see the first menu obviously the squelch. So we'll just have a quick run through this menu because there's, there's one or two little bits on there. Anyway, um, on the menu, menu, you can, first menu item is zero, so you can basically go between different menus, but when you select them Squelch. by pressing this button, it turns red, and then you can, uh, you know, change the squelch level. Obviously, the lesser the number, the weaker the squelch, the higher the number, the higher the confirm. squelch. And then you can confirm it. Then you can move on to step number one, which is the next one. So again, you can select between 12, well, uh, two and a half kilohertz, five kilohertz, 6.25, and 10 kilohertz, 12 and a half kilohertz, 20 kilohertz, 25 and 50 kilohertz, which is pretty good. Um, so they're, they're programmable steps. Step. And obviously, you know, you can, whichever one's highlighted in red is the one that you're choosing. And then you can just press Confirm. OK. Move on to the next one, which is uh, menu number two, memory channel. Um, so this is where, for example, you would uh, define a memory channel. It says, uh, use to create new channels 0 through to 256, so that can be accessed from the memory channel mode. So that's the um, mode at the top here, this, this channel list here. So this is where you can create your channels. It says, um, if the icon CH- is displayed, the channel is already stored. So that's something Menu. else that we can, we can do. Alright, so on to item number three then, uh, when I can turn the page. Um, which is uh, Dell channel, I think it is. Uh, delete a stored channel. If there is no channel in the font, the channel, uh, in the front, sorry, the channel has no parameters and the operation is invalid. So that's for deleting, deleting the channel, that. Uh, and then item number four is, um, according to this, uh, item number four, they've, del they've actually, this is Dell, Dell Channel, Dell Channel uh, CTCSS, RCTCSS. So basically receive standard CTCSS and uh, select the standard Menu. tone or input non-standard tone and they've made a mess in the manual here because I said item number four would be Dell channel and it isn't it's RCTCSS anyway uh, the next one is RDCS which is for digital coded squelch so you can input non-standard tone via the keypad as well you can go to different tones uh, menu number six is transmit CTCSS between 67 and 254.1 Hz Menu number seven is transmit DCS, digital coded squelch, so you can select your non-standard tones as well. Um, tone uh, menu number eight is the voice priority, or pri as it says, voice pre. So basically, we've got encryption. Um, menu encryption one, encryption two, encryption three. It says subtone encrypt if enabled. So basically. Uh, you can, if you wish, Menu. Um, encrypt the actual sub-audio CTCSS tones. And there's three different encryptions for that. Why you'd want to do that, I don't know. Confirm. It seems a bit silly to me. <clears throat> anyway, next uh, next one on the list is number nine, uh, which is channel name. So you can show the name or replace it with channel number. So you can put in text if you want. Um, so you can do that. Um, that's entirely up to you. Um, menu number 10. That's basically uh, transmit power. So you can have it set power. as uh, high, middle, low, that kind of thing. Um, so you can confirm that. Confirm. So high power is 5 watts, middle power is two and a half watts and low power is one watt. Next menu item is number 11, power save disable. 
selects the radio uh, ratio of sleep cycles to awake so obviously the the higher the number Menu. the longer the battery lasts the higher number increases the RX sleep cycle but you may miss the first few syllables of a radio transmission before the receive opens so you've got basically um, normal mode super mode and deep mode so that's uh, menu man get to it menu uh, messing about here normal mode i think save mode so that's your battery saver or you can knock it off if you want so we'll have, Confirm. It, have it on normal mode right menu number 12 menu number 12 is roger bleep so you could have a beep sends at the end of a transmission a tone to indicate the other station to the other station that the transmission menu. has ended so you can have that or you can have what's called MDC 1200 send a frog sound so it can send a frog rivet sound I think as well at the end of a transmission menu uh, tone uh, menu number 13 is a timeout timer for transmit this feature provides a safety switch that limits the transmission time to a pre-programmed value um, menu. and then Vox now Vox is for voice operated transmission it's not normally recommended you should have Vox because obviously um, if it picks up any noise around itself it would force radio menu. into transmit so basically uh, off is disabled or 1 to 9 is activate the Vox function level uh, 1 is most sensitive and then nine is least sensitive and it will then obviously you know prevent false transmissions uh wide and narrow uh wide and narrow modes here uh, item number 15 in the menu wide band is for 25 kilohertz bandwidth for the receiver narrow is for menu um, bandwidth 12 and a half kilohertz uh as well so you can obviously go between wide and narrow that's pretty good for when you're listening to 12.5 kilohertz division channels of course the modulation width is 2.5 kilohertz plus or minus uh, whereas opposed to wide it's four plus or minus 4.5 kilohertz Menu. so sometimes narrow band transmissions on 12.5 kilohertz channels can sound a bit quiet when it's in wide mode so at least here uh, you know you can switch between them Channel and, uh, and, and go between it that's that uh, right so the next one Confirm. is uh, item number 16 which is voice so it says here off voice prompts off on voice prompts on so that's what we're hearing now when it talks to us item number 17 beep prompt so you can have a key beep on or off uh, item number 18 is uh, language of the radio either in English or Chinese doesn't support any other languages uh, channel um, menu 19 is BCL busy channel lockout so it basically if that's on if the receiver is receiving a signal it will menu. prevent it will prevent the transmitter from transmitting while ever the receiver is activated and receiving a signal item number 20 is uh, time scanning when the radio detects a signal it pauses scanning and remains for about five seconds even if the signal is still present with radio, we'll still we'll continue scanning. Uh, so in TO mode, that's that, time scanning. In CO mode, uh, if I can Menu. go back to it, in CO mode, uh, it's carrier scanning. When it detects a signal, the radio stops scanning and remains on the channel frequency. It continues to scan when the signal disappears. So item number um, uh, 21 allows you to assign the function Menu. you want as a short cut to the radio PF2 keys this corresponds to short press so basically um, the side buttons on the radio here these can be configured in that menu. menu and you can select between off radio, NOAA, light, search, scan, TX power monitor and PTT2 so Menu okay now again uh, item number 22 pf2 long press uh, again same options again you can basically select what you want that key to do and, and pf3 menu which is this item number 23 is pf3 uh, which so basically i think pf1 2 and 3 
Uh, that's PF1 and 2 I think and that's PF3, that orange button on the top. So that's what those Menu. allow you to set where you've got menus 20, 21 and 23. 20, 21, 22 and 23 basically set up that. Menu. Okay, um, item number 24 is the PF3 long press obviously. Um, so it's 20 to 24, your settings for that. Um, again, Menu. item number 25 is a top key. Um, again, you can select that as well as to what you want. Uh, item number 26 is ABR operation. So backlight is always on. Or you can have uh, basically zero to three minutes for backlight auto switch off time. Menu. Uh, offset is the next one on 27, menu number 27. Repeat offset. It is the frequency difference between transmit and receive. So you can pre-program what, what it is uh, on your two meter 77 menu. repeaters or your uh, PMR repeater. Okay then, so the next one then is item number 28. Just need to lick my fingers to uh, turn the page. So item number 28 is um, Menu. SFTD. Enables access to repeater mode. Off is no repeater shift. Plus mode it will be... Menu. Um, Frequency direction. Frequency direction, that's it. So basically it's like... Uh, do you want to transmit on the output of the repeater? Do you want to transmit on the input of the repeater? So you can switch the transmit receive frequencies Cancel. the opposite way around. Uh, item number 29 is scan CTCSS. So basically you can set the radio scanning and if it drops on a radio frequency without the valid CTCSS subtone Menu. you would set in here Cancel. Um, Cancel then it would it would then only pick up the CTCSS tone that you've selected and it would look for that when it's scanning. Uh, item number 30 is scan digital coded squelch so again doing the same scan but this time looking out for a predetermined DCS. Uh, item Ten. item Menu. number 31 is uh, CTCSS save mode so basically, uh, it can um, all CTCSS is saved, RX CTCSS is saved, or TX CTCSS is saved. So that's that's a mode there that you can do. Um, number thirty-two is power on message, so you can either have it to display a logo or voltage, so you can show the battery voltage. Item number 33 is uh, ANI name, number 1 to number 60, the radio ID code. So you can put its own ID code in. Uh, appertaining to this radio, like an asset or a, um, a radio number, call sign. Item number 34 is the S code, DTMS signal codes. So you can put in there um, predetermined DTMS signal codes there as well. Presumably it will pick that up and beep if it receives the right DTMF uh, signal code. So the DTMF code is off. Um, uh, transmit DTMF code when you press the PTT um, or uh, transmit DTMF code when you release the PTT or both. <coughs> okay. Uh, menu number 36 uh, DTMFST so basically off when transmitting press the PTT uh, type DTMF code radio will not emit the sound code uh, when it's in DT-ST mode when transmitting press the PTT type the DTMF code radio will emit the DTMF tones okay so that's that select that 37. Uh, auto LK or auto lock, I think it is, is keypad lock turn off or time to auto keypad lock. Um, 38 is the tone and it basically says that, um, oh sorry, scan address 
it says add or delete the channels into the scan list so that's an add but you can add channels or delete them in the scan list right number 39 now tone uh, can send out a tone burst if you simultaneously press PF2 key while holding down the PTT key so as we can see there we've got the DTMF uh, well the 1750 tone burst for opening up amateur radio repeaters um, so that's there item number 40 PTTLT uh, time delay before automatic DTMF transmitting item number 41 menu exit time during the menu operation the delay time for exiting due to no operation so I want to change that because it's getting a pain in the backside changing all the pressing these buttons down let's have a look here ah, messed it up already right, let's have a look here number 40 Right, I don't know why it's got that. Right, let's go to this. PTT. LT, delay before to make it. It's not that one I want. This next one in it. Menu exit, there we go. Thirty seconds, there we are, that's better. Right, number forty one. That's it, menu exit time. So that's how long the menu would uh, remain on before it, it drops back to where it was before right 42 Vox delay so that's the transmit delay time when the Vox um, is activated 43 is uh, RP underscore STE this function is used to eliminate squelch tail noise and you can select basically 1 to 10 seconds Turn the page over. Have a look at the other side now. <coughs> so. Okay, so number 44. Uh, this is a repeat dash RL delay. The tail tone of repeater. So, no idea what that is. It just says delay the tail tone of a repeater. 45 MDF A. You can have uh, A band show frequency or channel, uh, a band show channel number or name, show channel name. 46 is MDF B. So you can show A or B band between these 45 and 46 menu settings with frequency channel or name. 47 is TDR, dual frequency standby off or on dual frequency standby on so presumably if that's in off mode you'll only get one uh, display showing uh, the next one is 48 TXAB uh, basically you can select between A or B or off where you can select press PT to transmit on band A or band B and you can set that in there 49 is STE uh, squelch tail noise eliminate off this function is used to eliminate squelch tail noise between our handhelds that are communicating directly, not via repeater. Uh, the next one is menu number 50, all mod, AL mod. It says here, um, it says set, oh, sight, field alarm, uh, sound, send alarm sound code, send alarm tone. So that's probably to do with that uh, orange button on top. 51 RX N tail off disabled on MDC 1200 signaling so it must send a probably a tone out on the RX tail or something and mute it somehow I'm not sure what the MDC 1200 is it didn't explain menu number 52 tail frequency 55 hertz to 62.5 uh, for the RX tail tone so I think they've gone a bit too far with that to be honest but I don't know it seems a bit strange all these weird things that they've had on there like frogs and tones that come on to tell you that the transmission's ending it all seems a bit overkill to me anyway my menu number 53 scrambler so voice scrambler function provides two scrambler frequencies 
prevent parties on other radios at same frequency from hearing and understanding your voice. So in there, the scram there's off obviously. Scrambler one and scrambler two. And that's your lot. So we'll have a play around with that soon. Find out what that's like. Uh, menu number um, 54 now reset so you can basically reset just the VFO menu initialization or all menu and channelized personalization and then menu number 55 yeah so reset it and then when we go back into the menu uh, 55 is the firmware version and all that malarkey and then we've got uh, menu number 56 which is the last of them which is the instructions um, no idea what that is I haven't a clue doesn't tell you in the manual anything about that what the instructions are so maybe that's something to do with the earlier menu where it gives you voice instructions when you're using it um, anyway it says uh, other functions as well um, that it, it does it says here other function descriptions and settings dual PTT function when the PSYC EPF2 is selected as PTTB the radio enters a dual uh, PTT mode and um, press PTT to transmit section A and PF2 PTTB to transmit section B so it might be, you can have a PTT switch for each individual sub-menu, so PTT switch just de designated uh, for, the, for the top one, and another PTT switch, say that button there, for the bottom frequency there. AM mode, when operating frequency range between 108 to 136, the radio automatically enters the AM reception mode, and the channel status displays AM. This mode is mainly used to receive AM modulated signals. Scan mode. Use a psyche to turn on or press the on hold the um, this button there, that one, with the little arrow pointing left, and that then sets it in uh, in scan mode when that happens. And obviously, uh, you know, it'll start scanning as we can see there as well. So there's that, and what else? Have a look. That's about it. Doesn't uh, give you any other information other than that. So that's your lot. At least we've had a look through that bit. Um, onwards and upwards. Okay, so I'm wanting to test encryption now. So what I've done on this one, uh, I've gone into menu. menu. And I put the scrambler one on, okay, which is that menu item there. So it's on scrambler one. Confirm. Okay. Now when I transmit, now I'll turn the volume right up on this uh, this bit here, and. Uh, one two three four five five four two one. This is a test one two three four five five one two one two. Ready test transmission one two three four five. So. That's so you can definitely hear there it's scrambled. So if I put, uh, it sounds like just speech inversion to me. Menu. If I go to the same menu, I can't know what menu number menu. it is now. Number, number menu fifty-three. All right. Um, you can probably enter in five three as well. I think. Yeah. Yeah, you can. No, you can't. Huh. Not a good one, is it? 53? No, you can't. Right. Nearly there. Right, 53. So we'll select the scrambler on that then. To scrambler 1. Confirm. Confirm. That's it. Right. Radio test one two three four five. This is a test in scrambler mode one. So yeah. 
Hey, they'll test one, two, one, two. So obviously with the scrambler off, um, if we turn that to off. Menu. Oops, what a mess. Actually, so let's scramble a two. We'll try that as well in a minute. Yes, yeah, off. Confirm. This is a test one, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one. One, two, one, two, three, four, five. You're going to test transmission. Uh, you're going to test one, two, one, two, one, two. Yeah, so let's try scramble a two then. Menu. Oops. Two. Confirm. Right. If I two transmit on the other one, the scrambler one, it shouldn't pick it up. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, it is. It is picking it up. Sounds a bit uh, um, throaty. Like I've got a bit of a flow, but. Right. I'm just going to uh, put this now on scrambler. Scrambler two. Confirm. Right. It's okay. Right. Radio test one two, yeah, that sounds a lot clearer. So there's not much difference between Scrambler one and Scrambler two insofar as the codex concerned. It's just mildly different, that's all. So it's not anything that's uh, going to prevent comms if you switch between them. But we are transmitting in Scramble mode at the moment, and it seems to be working. Okay, so we'll just confirm that by going back to menu. Off. Scrambler, oops. I keep, I keep doing that, don't I? Oh, no. Confirm. Okay, so I'll switch the scrambler off now on uh, on this damn thing. Let's have a look. Uh, oh. Scrambler. Confirm. Right. Radio test one two, this is in the clear, no scramble mode. Yeah, so that proves the scrambler works. Uh, so pretty good, not bad at all. Onwards and upwards. Okay, so we'll uh, we'll check the UHF first. I'll put it on 433. Four, three, three, zero, zero, zero. Okay. We're on 433 megahertz. It's just doing just under uh, 5 watts uh, when we look at uh, this part of the display there. Let me just where my finger is. Uh, so just under 5 watts on UHF. 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This is a radio test. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So it's doing about uh, 5, about 4.5 kilohertz deviation there on uh, on transmit, which is quite good. We'll just have a quick look at uh, VHF. Um, so I'll put in uh, one, four, five, five. zero. It's zero, on 145 megahertz dead, and then transmit again on high power and see what it's like. So that's uh, just under three. Is it just under three watts? It's not particularly good that on high power. Um, just out of interest, I'll try two, it on two. 220 megahertz. Zero, 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 zero. Just to see what it's like on that transmit. So it's doing more power on uh, 220 megahertz than it is on 145 megahertz, which is interesting. Hmm. So that just shows you the differences in power between VHF and UHF. The higher up we get towards UHF spectrum, then uh, obviously the uh, the higher the TX power. Let's just Three. try 300 megahertz. Zero, 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 zero. So this is 300 megahertz now, and uh, it's only doing milliwatts, but it's still transmitting though, which is quite interesting. Uh, let's try 200 Two. megahertz then. Zero, 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 zero. So 200 megahertz. Transmitting at uh, 5.21 watts there, roughly. So, unfortunately, One, down at 145 four, megahertz. Zero, zero, zero. 
it doesn't uh, transmit at particularly high amounts of power but it's still not bad uh, you know still usable but not what I would expect yeah so that shows us the transmit side okay we'll check the receiver now um, I'll do um, let's see now RX test uh, RF gen frequency 145.0 megahertz RF gen level okay so we can see there the uh, there's a signal meter as well on this particular radio which is this here just on the bottom corner there as I increase the RF signal generator level now or decrease it um, you'll be able to see the effect well. there it is look it's that bar there on this particular thing because we're on the top display so you can see as I just gradually reduce the signal you can see the signal bars starting to go up and down if I increase the signal reduce the signal now the receiver sensitivity is very good I mean that's an egg 125 dBm uh, which in microvolts uh, if I can get microvolts to read that's like 0.1 of a microvolt and I'd say that that's that's about I'd say the 12 dB point just there and we've got the green LED on that signifies receive so that's a very good spec receiver is that uh, very good indeed uh, not bad at all so let's just have a look at uh, 220 megahertz Right, 220 megahertz, 220 megahertz. That's still as good. Pretty good. I'll try uh, 433 megahertz. And then we'll do the same there. 433.0 megahertz. Again, superb receiver sensitivity. Now bit later on what I might do is put it on a multi-pass signal generator I have a signal generator here that has four outputs on it so you can set up an interfering signal on the adjacent um, channel and then put the fundamental on the receiver so that you can test its selectivity so that will be interesting but the actual receiver sensitivity on VHF as well as, uh, as UHF is very very good, exceptionally good quality that Okay, so I'm just going to test out a theory now by putting it on the, uh, if I can get it to go on to the, um, now then, I can just get it to go on to, no it won't let me go on to, unless it's because it's receiving, although well, if it's receiving it doesn't let you go to music, radio, that's it. Right, I just want to see what it's like on 70.4 megahertz. We've got 70.4 megahertz in there, it's effectively a broadcast radio station. But I just want to see what it's like. Uh, 70.4 megahertz. Oh, messed that up. 70.4 megahertz. Just make sure I've typed that in properly because I might have mistyped that. 70.4 megahertz. RF gen level. No, it's not picking up. Oh, hang on. I've got the SIG gen on, have I? There we are. So, there is something there. Point, sort of, half a microvolt there, look. And then, that's one microvolt just there. So, it is just picking something up. So, again, you know can listen to with the volume really high up you can listen to a signal um, which is you know on 4 meter amateur band at 70.4 megahertz in very good sensitivity as well down there look I mean that's you know coming right down now less than a microvolt sensitivity is really good so that proves that works 
yeah, they're quite interesting. Right, we'll have a look at uh, transmit analysis now on the harmonic side of things to see what that's like. Okay, I've just put in 145 megahertz dead. I put auto tune on. I think this is he's putting up now to uh, one, four, five. Zero, zero, zero. Right, so we'll just check its frequency accuracy first as well on transmit before we go to spectrum analyzer. So it's, uh, it's not doing bad. I'll just put that to off. Set up the ETS frequency again. Sorry, 145 megahertz. So it's only um, ooh, very, very good frequency accuracy is that. When we look at the offset there, I mean, we're only talking less than 100 hertz typically uh, at random so very very uh, good frequency accuracy okay so we'll go to spectrum analyzer now and we'll have a look at now we're on 145 megahertz we'll do an expand um, so we can see that more clearly um, da -da 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 -da. we'll increase this to 50 megahertz per division now if I key up there, that's 50 kilohertz per division. So if I said 50 megahertz per division, so that's the fundamental frequency anyway there that we can see from the transmission, and then we should start to see the first harmonic at least very shortly uh, when we get higher up the. There we are. Look right. So if I unkey a second, just to explain, this peak here isn't actually a signal. Uh, it's actually a no uh, where the Spectrum analyzer starts from this radio test set goes up from uh, basically 400 kilohertz to 1 gigahertz. So um, we've widened the span of the um, spectrum analyzer as wide as we can nearly get it. I think it only goes up another step. Um, but basically, this is a start point. Now we can verify that by putting the markers on. And uh, if we enable the markers, we get two markers, which you can see on that peak both of which marker 1 and marker 2 M1 here if you look at the frequency if I move a marker for example you can see where the markers go into in frequency this particular measurement it goes up as high as about uh, what is it um, 400 megahertz so this end line is 400 megahertz but the start frequency if you notice where that peak is it's zero hertz you see so it's not actually a signal just the way that it represents the start frequency of the uh, the sweep for the um, span that was selected. So we'll be able to see basically from zero to 400 megahertz. So obviously the harmonics are going to be multiples of a fundamental frequency. So twice the frequency of the fundamental will be the first harmonic. Um, so if we key the transmitter up, we should be seeing a very small amplitude of harmonic, the RF power the first harmonics or all the harmonics should be really small it should be like microwatts in power way down on the actual carriers at amplitude but i can see straight away there when i key up that's a fundamental frequency 145 megahertz this is a first harmonic and as you can see the amplitude is significantly high and this is the issue with these radios coming out of china particularly the bofangs these rad tells various other makes that are coming out of china uh, they cause a lot of interference to the radio users on the spectrum. Now if we look at this, we'll analyse that uh, now by moving the marker to that frequency there. And so we can draw out that in better context, better detail. But basically this is a frequency roughly of the harmonic. It won't be precise because the span's so wide. Um, but there again, the amplitude is what worries me. I mean, we're talking there... Well, plus 30 dBm is one watt of RF power. And when you look at that, that's not far off that level in, in dBs. It's actually um, 36 over time. plus 30 something dBm. I think that reads there, plus 36 or 26. I can't see from here, but we'll have a further analysis of that. And uh, it's just under, yeah, it's about 25.7 dBm. So that's significant power. That could definitely cause interference to somebody on that frequency, um, without a doubt. So, not particularly good. So we'll widen the span up now. Ignore these down here. These are just to repeat and mirror this, because it, it mirrors it over. But 
basically that's your fundamental frequency right in the dotted line in the middle that's the first harmonic the second and the third harmonic so the second harmonic frequency roughly is around about 436 megahertz and again that's not far off of uh, well it's plus 4 dBm which isn't good definitely uh, and this one is in the 900 megahertz band with the look of it cellular band uh, yeah round about that and that's sticking out 10 dBm plus 10 dBm so we'll, we'll look at these frequencies in more detail now and uh, have a look at the absolute levels of what they are uh, and compare them to where they should be okay so let's have a look I'll just put that marker back down to this fundamental frequency there roughly we're roughly around for that first harmonic around 292 megahertz so on key the radio just to give it a rest because obviously it'll start overheating um, so if we come right back out and I do a, a TX frequency of uh, 292 megahertz let's see if I can get the damn thing to uh, read the center frequency oh hang on you have to come out of expand don't you there we go TX frequency uh, 292 megahertz back into expand and then key up and this is where when we're looking at the the wide <coughs> uh, span of the spectrum analyzer because it's so wide the resolution the frequency accuracy decreases so in order to uh, further analyze each um, tone each harmonic we've got to um, get the rough frequency of where it was on the scope when we're looking at all the harmonics and then we've got to pull out the analysis further then we've got to home in on that one frequency find it as you can see it wasn't bang on that frequency it's slightly lower uh, by a few hundred hertz or a few kilohertz here or there so we have to grab that move it to center of the screen so we can analyze it so if i do uh, marker one and then just look at that frequency it's actual frequency believe it or not is uh 289.990 megahertz so roughly uh, anyway so there should be a marker to center frequency um, beat find expand off all right don't know where that is on this spectrum analyzer 289 megahertz peak find ah that's it there i think there we are right we'll just open that up a bit more now and then get more frequency accuracy out of it so you can see it's phase it's slightly out there but it's definitely there it's nasty harmonic right marker one marker two marker one let's measure the peak or oh, we can do peak find there so the actual RF level is plus 25 dBm so that is a significant amount of RF power so you're talking a few hundred milliwatts there of RF power so if you are then transmitting into an antenna externally say you connected this radio into a a base station antenna for example with a gain of x number of dbs a collinear um, antenna for example then that few hundred milliwatts effective radiator power means it can be quite a few watts at that harmonic frequency and it can cause a lot of interference to the radio users using that frequency and i think that frequency is, looks like smack bang in the military uh, air band um, the nato military band so that's not particularly good so you could be innocently talking on, um, you know, two meter amateur band, giving your call sign out and um, chatting away. And the next thing you know, you've got the um, Ofcom at your door because, or the FCC or whichever country you're in, because you're causing interference to uh, the military air band um, or users on that frequency. Um, I think with the way this radio is, with its spectral purity, with the amount of frequencies that it transmitted on simultaneously, I think the Chinese are trying to conquer 
the market where they have a radio that just broadcasts on all frequencies. So you don't actually need to know what frequency you're on anyway because you'll just transmit on everything that there is. So it's like full spectral transmitter. Um, it's almost like a, a radio jammer in a way uh, for electronic countermeasures. Let's have a look. So this is the other harmonic now. We'll zip over to that. Um, and this one is roughly at a frequency of give or take um, 434 megahertz so again zoom back out change the frequency now to 434 megahertz back in again to expand and then we'll just transmit we've got the, the harmonic there so the radio is getting a bit warm now because I'm transmitting for quite long periods of time and uh, I don't think it likes it so let's just expand that out a bit yeah, it's uh, not at all good that let's just move that peak find um, so let's have a look that's the peak find button there Right, so you're looking at plus five and a half dBs there, plus 5.5 dBm of RF signal. Well, zero dBm is one milliwatt, so you're talking um, tens of milliwatts of RF power there, roughly. We'll work it out exactly a bit later when we look at it on the ESA spectrum analyzer, because it's uh, more accurate than this uh, basic spectrum analyzer that is in this Marconi. But um, yeah, that's uh, not good at all. I'm afraid not good at all so let's just have a look here at the uh, the other harmonic then that was higher up this one here which I think was at the 900 megahertz band so we'll have a look at the approximate frequency of that and that's on uh, 900 and oh, hang on a minute oh sorry 580 megahertz 580 megahertz is there one at 900 though? I thought there was one at 900. Perhaps I misread it. Yeah, I might have misread it. I might have said it was 900 nod, but it isn't. It's 580 megs roughly. So let's just go back out then. Uh, 580 megahertz, TX frequency. Oh, come on, TX frequency. Uh, 580 megahertz. We've got something there. We can hear, you can hear myself. Hello, hello, hello. This is a radio test. Uh, so, exactly. 580 megahertz. And then we can zoom in again. So there we go. Look, this is the... Uh, that's my modulation, you see, on the FM carrier. So, not good. Not good at all. We were going so well till we got to this point. Nice radio, looks great, it's got all the fancy bells and whistles and, you know, does all the mod cons, all these features on it, great receiver, superb looking radio, all, all these wonderful features, and yet it's got the most filthiest transmitter that there is in the universe. Um, it's just absolutely disgraceful, um, in far as its specifications on transmit. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you were transmitting on this on... Uh, on obviously VHF you're covering most of the VHS spectrum with harmonics and right up to 580 megahertz in this case um, I can't see any harmonics higher than 580 although I thought I did earlier I thought I did see harmonics at 900 and something megahertz but there's definitely nothing nothing there I thought I saw more harmonics unless it's with temperature because the radio is quite hot now, the metal back on the on the radio is quite hot. But anyway, onwards and upwards. We'll have a look at the uh, ESA measurement now on the ESA um, spectrum analyzer and um, do some very accurate measurements on here. So that's what we'll do next. Okay, now we're on to a different piece of test equipment we're going to be using. Uh, Agilent ESA. See a spectrum analyzer. This basically goes from zero to three gigahertz as its frequency range. 
Um, when we're making a direct measurement like we're going to be doing of a transmitter, as you'll see in my other videos, I play a particular emphasis on protecting the instrument from excessive input power, obviously because that's the way that you should be doing the measurement. Um, the measurement here carries a warning of plus 30 dBm maximum, which is equivalent to 1 watt on the RS signal input port. So as a rule of thumb, I tend to work with uh, anything below or at 50% of a total rated input power, so 500 milliwatts will be the maximum that I would um, want to feed into that spectrum analyzer, and that's in the worst case. Now, in this case, we've got a dynamic range of 100, basically um, from plus 30 dBm to minus 100 dBm. So the dynamic range on the spectrum analyzer is quite large. Um, so that affords us to use high levels of attenuation as well. Um, but also within the instrument there is a variable attenuator which we'll be setting later but um, that makes no difference insofar as the RF power going in at the front the absolute maximum power the spectrumizer can take is one watt no matter what the RF attenuator is doing the switching attenuator behind the, the cover there so we must never exceed that power no matter what and we must always calculate a headroom so that if a transmitter was to unexpectedly double its out output power, which you've seen in other videos, can happen, particularly when testing mobile radios, radios which have multi-modes on them, such as AM, FM and SSB, the powers can vary quite widely depending on operating mode. There's also issues where the supplies can be varied or there's a higher low power setting on the radio and if you were to inadvertently make a measurement in low power and accidentally knock into high power, the RF signal coming in there will be excessive and it will blow the very expensive spectrum analyzer up. So, as I say, I like to work to this 50% headroom. So, if the spectrum analyzer was to be given an excessive input through doubling the RF power on the test device, it's still going to be below the rate of maximum input on the spectrum analyzer. And I always advise anybody who's making measurements on spectrum analyzers to make um, apply a signal basically to the front of the spectrum analyzer as minimal as possible that allows you still to make the measurement without damaging the input. Now obviously we're going to have to select an attenuator in this case as the appropriate dB attenuation and power handling capacity in order to attenuate the RS signal at 5 watts radio frequency energy down to such a level where the spectrum analyzer can make that analysis, that measurement. Uh, and so we need to do a bit of a, a, a formula, if you like, which we'll go through now, on looking at what level of attenuation we need to apply externally here in order to uh, attenuate the signal to is it a minimum level of attenuation. Um, but we're quite fortunate in this case, the spectrum has got a wide dynamic range. So, um, for every 3 dB as we attenuate a signal with half its output power, so in this typical example I'm going to use here, we know that the transmitter power is roughly 5 watts maximum. So if we say 5 watts, okay, uh, so if we were to introduce a 3 dB attenuator such as this, um, say this could take 5 watts, which it can't incidentally, but if it could, so that's a, say a 3 dB attenuator, then the RF power leaving that attenuator for 3 dBs would equal 2.5 watts, okay? If we made it a 6 dB attenuator, it would be 1.25 watts. And if we made it a 9 dB attenuator, it would give us 0 0.625 watts. And if it was a 12 dB attenuator, it would give us 0 0.3125 watts, okay? So, in this particular case, a 9 dB would give us um, 625 milliwatts of power. A 12 dB would give us 312 milliwatts of power. So I would tend to go with the 12 dB as a minimum, a minimum level of attenuation. However, let's say for example there was a transmitter under test that suddenly uh, increased its output power to 10 watts because there was a, an issue where it was knocked into high power or it changed its mode from say FM to SSB and it was transmitting at double the output power that it would normally do. Would a 12 dB attenuator uh, be acceptable? 
or a 9 dB even in this case. Well, for obviously at 10 watts power, we're doubling everything basically. Um, so a 3 dB uh, would give us, um, in our case, 5 watts, obviously. A 6 dB would give us uh, 2.5 watts. A 9 dB would give us 1.25 watts. And a 12 dB would give us 0.625 watts. So if we need to look at that as far as headroom because if we were to choose a 9 dB attenuator because that still gives us way under the maximum limit of the spectrum analyzer at 0.625 watts we can clearly see here the 9 dBs used at 10 watts input power is clearly excessive for what the spectrum analyzer can take so the input power then should the transmitter double itself whatever reason that is believe me there are many reasons that can happen that that input power will be excessive by 250 milliwatts and so that's the damage level to the spectrum analyzer and that's what we've really got to avoid in all circumstances um, so a 12 db is a minimum we need for transmitters of power of 5 watts and 10 watts okay the maximum level of db attenuation we could go up to could be as high as 30 db because it's still within the dynamic range of the spectrum analyzer so you know if we attenuate the signal too much say uh, by 100 dbs then naturally the output power of the um, signal will be too low for the spectrum analyzer to measure within its dynamic range so we've always got to keep within the dynamic range of whatever instrument we're using be it a frequency counter a modulation meter spectrum analyzer or some other device that needs a, a given input level in order to make a measurement so that's what you've got to bear in mind when you're doing these these measurements you may not have a 12 db attenuator you might have um, a 15 db attenuator or a 20 db or a 30 db attenuator that's still usable but what we're looking at here is a minimum level because the last thing you want to do is connect a signal to the spectrum analyzer miscalculate the level of attenuation and then blow the spectrum analyzer up obviously very expensive instruments and that's the last thing you want it's definitely a face slapping moment is that so onwards and upwards let's have a look at what attenuators we've got and then we can select the right one okay so what we're doing now is we're, we're making a measurement of an RF attenuator that I've chosen this particular attenuator is rated at 30 dBs at uh, 20 watts so that's more than capable of handling the RF power we want gives us 30 dBs of attenuation it's always wise to check attenuators especially power attenuators uh, because some of them are not bi-directional so if you get them the wrong way around and some attenuators are made where the end female is actually the one that connects to the instrument and the end male connects to your device under test others like this one the end male connects to the instrument and the end female connects to the device under test you can never be too certain unless they're marked input or output some attenuators I've got here which I've shown on my channel several times show an input and output label others don't, this one doesn't so we need to test that because if we're getting the wrong way around the attenuation changes and it can mean that the instrument can get too much power in that case and that you know you're making a measurement and it's wrong um, so what we've done here we've set up um, a couple of things really we've set up the spectrum analyzer by calibrating the track gen output and the signal input as well as the signal input to the cal standard which is just off the screen there so as part of the uh, use of a spectrum analyzer naturally we go back to basics we have to calibrate the um, alignments of the spectrum analyzer for the uh, calibration standard the reference there for the sig gen input as well as the or the signal input rather as well as the track gen output that's linked to the signal input and then you do alignments and align the instrument properly uh, leave the instrument to warm up for a minimum of half an hour obviously before you make measurements sometimes people rush into making accurate frequency stability measurements and power without letting the instrument warm up and then it can drift uh, while it gets warm 
So that's what you want to avoid. But you must always do your calibration routines before you start making measurements because otherwise the measurement will be off. The instrument needs to self-align periodically and it will often remind you to do that anyway. Now, because we're using a test cable, uh, which is this purple connector here, this purple cable, that goes off to the transceiver and because there's about a meter here of cable, what we need to do is calibrate to the end of the cable. So we need to factor in the attenuation, not only the RF attenuator, but the cable that connects to the device under test. Now, um, what I've done, I've set the spectrum analyzer up to um, give a track gen output um, across a wide frequency range with a reference power of zero dBm, which is one milliwatt, leaving this port, which then goes into the attenuator, gets attenuated through it and then read on the instrument's display. Now, that figure is very important because we're going to have to take that figure, write it down, and we're going to then enter that into the spectrum analyzer to then let the spectrum analyzer um, equate that as part of its measurement so that we can read fundamental RF power coming from the radio transceiver as if we were directly connecting that as a power meter to the spectrum analyzer. So in, a, in essence, we can make very accurate power measurements of the fundamental and harmonic frequencies by making sure we get this level here correct by assuming that level um, is um, the level of all the device under test, the um, cables and attenuators and connectors that go to the device under test means that we're going to make a very accurate measurement. So we can see there roughly, um, it's differing a bit, but it's not exactly 30 dBs, is it? It's like 30 point, I'd say, 4, 30.4 dBs, I'd say. So we've got approximately 0.4 of a dB loss. Uh, this purple cable is aerospace, defence grade cable, very low loss, up to about 18 gigahertz. So at these frequencies, it's very, very low loss indeed. Um, so if I write down 30.4 dBs, then we can use that figure later on then in our in our setting in the spectrum analyzer. So there we go. We're now ready to connect this connector now, uh, which is here. Now we've verified the attenuator is connected correctly and we've done our measurement. We're going to connect this end now to the transceiver and that will be um, the input power then obviously to the attenuator. Now with us having 30 dBs of attenuation and using the 3 dB rule we were looking at earlier, uh, with 30 dBs it's going to be reduced to about 5 milliwatts of power into the spectrum analyzer. Um, so that's a very good level for the spectrum analyzer to measure. Uh, it gives loads of headroom as well in the measurement. Um, that's equivalent to plus 7 dBm going in at 5 milliwatts. Obviously 0 dBm is 1 milliwatt. Uh, 5 milliwatts is 7 dBm. So we've got a very, very small signal. Nowhere near the maximum permissible input to the spectrum analyzer. No worries there about damage or anything like that. So now we're ready to make a measurement. Right, let's see if I can remember how to do this now on this instrument. Okay, so we preset the instrument, obviously. Uh, let it do that, which it's done. Uh, we go to the Y scale, I think it is. And we go to reference level offset. Now that's where we need now to enter in the figure we wrote down earlier, uh, which is um, 30.4 dB. So we need to put in uh, 30.4 dBs. So that's now going to take equate that into the measurement and all the cables, etc. We then need to go to the y-axis units and change that to uh, watts. Okay. And now we're ready to make a measurement. If we go back to frequency, and this time I'm going to type in one. Uh, 45 megahertz in uh, there and so what we're going to do now is we're going to uh, do span I'm going to put in 1 megahertz as a frequency span just check the frequency hasn't moved it hasn't okay now we're ready to do a, a measurement so there we go 
Okay, so we've uh, set up the instrument now with the frequency 145 MHz, 1 MHz band. I've set the uh, amplitude on the. Uh, let's have a look here. 871 milliwatts, 8 watts. Set it to about 6 watts. 5.495 watts. Let's have a look. So battery's gone down somewhat in doing the transmit test we were doing earlier. But uh, looking about uh, just under 2 watts there now on VHF. Okay, so now we're ready to do a measurement of the harmonics. So let's have a look here. Uh, do, 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 do. I could do a zero span as well on that span. Uh, zero span on that frequency and see what the level is there yeah, look 1.9 watts roughly 2 watts RF power on the fundamental frequency of 145.5 okay so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to span I'm going to set the span up to be um, 1 gigahertz okay again that signal down here is a zero uh, frequency. So if I move the, the marker ball, uh, we can see that when I finally get down there, that is, I can get to it. Might jump to it. I'm trying to see it. There we are. So when I'm looking at the right screen, there we go. Look. So as you can see there, you know, marker one. It's basically zero frequency, it says 2 megahertz there, but it's because we've got a 1 gigahertz span on it, so, you know, it's it's zero, basically. So that's where it starts from. So if we transmit, we should be able to see the harmonics that we can see there now, okay. Right, so if I go down to uh, the second harmonic I think it was, let's have a look where's my bouncy ball gone, there we are where's my bouncy ball up so the frequency there, 290 megahertz if I go frequency uh, 290 megahertz let's just have a look to see what we've got there, 290 megahertz Uh, marker again. Now we've widened it out a bit. Marker one. That's dead center frequency. Right span, one megahertz. So that's the total power of the first harmonic at uh, that frequency, 290 megahertz. Is um, just under 500 milliwatts look, or just 520 odd because the CTCSS is on the signals warbling a bit in phase but it's averaging about uh, 500 uh, milliwatts now we can see that better by doing a zero span and uh, if I'm going to do that now on this full zero span and then key up there you're looking at absolute power measurement of about 550 milliwatts so that's how much power there is there when I transmit, transmitting now on the first harmonic. Uh, go back to span, 1 megahertz, and again that's the first harmonic there. Okay, so we'll go to uh, 1 gigahertz span again, and then we'll just move the marker to this one. That's 435 megahertz roughly. So then we've got a frequency 435 megahertz. Have a look at that. Center frequency. Or the span to 1 megahertz. Hopefully it's not gone off a frequency. That's okay. So that's okay. And then we can have a look at that. I'm actually. Uh, frequency 
let's just have a look at what frequency that actually is. I'm moving frequency around in the marker this time. So, if you like, I'm moving frequency to the marker. So it's 434,990 roughly. Um, you can do a peak find, obviously, as well. Um, there's quite a few little bits and bobs you can do on this. So, but we can see that anyway. We're looking at about three milliwatts of RF power at 435 megahertz. So naturally, you know, we're interfering there too. Uh, if we go to frequency, span, then one gigahertz again, and then we've got another. Um, oops, another marker. And we've got another, we've got a few there, look, we've got one there, like with sidebands on it. And then another signal there, just below it, with sidebands on it. So let's just have a look at that. That's 576 megahertz. So frequency, uh, 576 megahertz. Span. This time I'm going to choose uh, just 10 megahertz. See if we can get those sidebands in. Uh, it's a bit further up, so if I go back to marker and marker to centre frequency, I can get the damn thing to do that. Mm. Let me do it, don't turn more. Eleven, twelve milliwatts. So uh, it's uh, it's not particularly good power that yeah obviously at that frequency it's a significant amount of power that uh, so you know it's not what you want is it in a transmitter twelve milliwatts wow at five hundred eighty megahertz frequency uh, span one gigahertz. Now, so we've seen those, we've got a couple of these side lobes there, haven't we? So, spam. Let's just have a look at that. What are they then? Let me see, we're now in key, and key up the... Oh, they've, they've gone now. Have they come back? Have a look, see if we get them to reappear. Yeah, there's something there, look. Right, marker. Around about 653 megahertz then. Frequency, 653 megahertz. Let's have a look. Span is 10 megahertz. Something there just briefly pops up, doesn't it? When I key up, I'm transmitting just then, just now, just now, just now. It just pops up. A bit of so it's obviously the VCO trying to get into lock as it goes on to transmit, and it's uh, coming out with some spurious emission. So I wonder what the frequency is like. Harmonic outputs like above uh, one gigahertz. I'm going to put a two gigahertz span in now, and now we can see. So there's pretty much. If we go back to marker, not much going on. That's uh, 600 megahertz, 610, 800, 950, 1.3 gigahertz, 1.4, 1.7. 1.9 right I'll change frequency now to 430 megahertz um, 430 right now if I key up on the transmitter on 430 megahertz that's actually quite clean Hmm, interesting. Right, so if I go uh, frequency, 
4.30 megahertz and then key the transmitter up spam again now it can get right in depth on there look frequency 4.30 megahertz so that's quite clean anyway let's widen the span up now to 2 gigahertz so there's no problem with UHF as far as spurious emissions are concerned what about 3 gigahertz then spam so a full 3 gigahertz span of his analyzer as you can see nothing there no harmonics so let's just attenuate the signal um, hang on, 3 gigahertz uh, amplitude just something there, a little bit down but we would be those levels will be very low though Look at that one there. Looking at microwatts, you see that's what it should be. Looking at seven, seven or eight, nine microwatts at 1.2 gigahertz, and then you're talking six microwatts at 858 megahertz. So that's that's how it should be. That's what what it should be like, which is acceptable. Uh, on UHF, so it looks like this radio is quite dirty on VHF. I'll put it on 220, oh, 228 megahertz then. Zero, zero, zero. Right, on 228 megahertz, it's not bad at all. Yeah. Yeah, so 228 megahertz, it's okay. Two. Let's try it to 200 megahertz. Zero, 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 zero. Right, that's 200 megahertz. Yeah, it's starting to show itself now. If I um, uh, get rid of this thing there, you can just see there's something there. Right, span, 1 gigahertz. Frequency uh, 100 megahertz roughly. Right, span 1 gigahertz. So you can start to see that there are some harmonics starting to appear. Just having to unkey, this radio is getting quite warm, but, but still, even then, we're talking microwatts you see if you get that level just bang on there look only talking microwatts so that's acceptable that's what the specification that we should be looking for but at 144 yeah. megahertz zero, zero, zero. then we get that so really um, if you're using the radio on the uh, if you're in the US for example and using it on the 200 megahertz allocation it's fine if you're using it on the UHF 77's allocation it's fine but if you're using it anywhere below um, near the 2 meter amateur band that's what you get you get massive amounts of uh, harmonic interference coming out so if you could just sort that problem out in the design then that would be a massive advantage you know that radio would be uh, would be worth using on 2 meters in its present format, it's in my view um, not advisable to use it on two meters because of the amount of interference that it uh, comes out with. I mean, when you look there, you can clearly see, you know, it's off a scale in in far as RF power is concerned on these harmonics. The massive amounts of of RF level. Uh, ideally, with harmonic measurements, um, we'll look at some service manuals a bit later with the. Uh, typical specification of say Kenwood product um, you're looking at microwatts um, you know level that it should be for spurious emissions 
so that the spurious emissions, the harmonics, can't radiate very far beyond the device and thus can't cause interference or cause uh, susceptible to interference nearby radio devices. Um, but yes, as you can clearly see there on the 2 meter band, there's a significant amount of RF power being transmitted on the uh, harmonic frequencies, which is not good at all. Okay, I've got a couple of radios here. We've got the Motorola HT600E radio that uh, was used a lot by the emergency services some years ago on the Kenwood TK350. Um, so we've got some service information here uh, from Motorola and from our friends at uh, Kenwood who manufacture the TK259 and 350 radios and Motorola. Now I've got the spec here for the Motorola HT600E uh, which is this radio and um, just to give you an idea of what we've just been looking at and how it applies in this context if we have a look at the transmitter specification which is uh, this section here on the spurious emission bits we can quite clearly see um, that round about here um, it's a spurious harmonic frequencies and there you go look so this is why it's really important to understand that because it's 0.25 microwatts so basically that's what we were getting when we were looking at the um, the UHF spectrum on the Rabtel we were getting the microwatts level in harmonics um, and UHF and above and that's what you want because this level here has got to be really low because if it's too high then your spurious emissions are going to have a high power content and they're going to emit further and obviously interfere with other radio communication services and it can be a life or death matter I mean you know if you are transmitting on a, a frequency that's then interfering with other radio communication services say for the emergency service for aircraft you know um, that kind of thing would be a very serious serious matter um, so having the spirit emissions as low as possible in the microwatts range means that the um, emission from the radio won't make it very far might make it within the immediate environment of the room you're in but certainly not beyond it especially in the microwatts range you certainly don't want it in the milliwatts or the watts area because that's where the radio signal can break free especially if you're on an external antenna uh, such as a collinear with gain at a high level of altitude on a radio tower or um, mounted on a mast high up uh, above um, ground the signal can travel a hell of a lot further and cause masses of interference to wider radio communication service over the wider geographical area so the it's in your interest to manufacture of a radio to keep the um, spurious emissions well below predetermined levels that are set by communication regulators in the countries or the marketplace where the radio is going to be sold so that it meets type approval and that um, naturally it can be sold legally in that country um, same again with the Kenwood um, I think the specification for the Kenwood is on the oh, it's on the back page yeah so this is a service manual for the Kenwood TK259 and again here in this section spurious emissions the Japanese might do it a little bit different to the Americans but basically they're quoting at 5 watts minus 70 dBs below the carrier so basically um, when we're looking at the spectrum analyzer the noise flow is about neg 100 dBs and we're looking at minus 70 dBs for the spurious emissions so again we're looking in the microwatts region again like we are with the Motorola and that's really really important is that because if you don't get that right then you're going to cause interference to all and sundry so yeah interesting stuff so this is a radio internally anyway within the uh, unit once you've got it out and uh, it goes in sort of that way with a back plate underneath anyway um, it's only a very thin small board everything's on one PCB in this particular one 
and uh, the power amplifier transistors for the um, final output of these two FETs here and they're the drivers for them and then the pre-drivers down here so you can see its architecture and they're just basically touching uh, the case where these uh, two little pads are there that's where they screw down to uh, so that the heat from the shells of the transistors can conduct away onto the heat sink back um, quite different to some designs I've seen where what they do is they actually um, have the heat sink on this side of the PCB where that gold area is but as you can see it's stitched through um, the grounds or what would be the uh, the ground plane of those transistors is bolted effectively through to this side of the circuit board and that itself has a screw eyelet there which goes through obviously via this to the um, case back so it has got quite good heat sinking I must admit um, as for very long transmissions I'm not sure at high power how long those transistors would last but uh, certainly some thought gone into that then we've got the bandpass filter uh, arrangement here before it goes to the SMA socket which you can see at the top of the picture on the top left so that's sort of a little rundown of the RF bit and uh, looks like we've got some IC down there with a clock crystal running in that area I'm not sure what that area is uh, we've got a processor here again with a clock crystal looks like some memory battery contacts there and then we've got the audio side of things i think that would be the audio pa down there just after the uh, volume potentiometer switch this one i think that'll be the audio pa we've got some volt regs etc knocking about but i think that's the memory and processor you know the flashy prom the um firmware's held on there this could be the um radio bit for the fm radio plus other functions as well so a couple of little things there to have a look at and consider this is the front of the uh, unit uh, with the LCD display you've got this uh, cover goes over that which you have to remove to get that little screw out down there but um, well put together I must admit you know the tactile switches all the uh, work that's gone into the side PTT monitor and radio function buttons are all well put together microphone and then the LED at the top as you can see and all the switches it's uh, quite good construction I must admit quite uh, surprised and um, I think we've got some information written on the on the board down here obviously made on 23rd of November 2022 and uh, little QC pass sticker there I think the other little bits and bobs the OLED display which is very clear and concise and uh, yeah built to last I'll say that with the look of it you know it's not rubbish right this is a Radtail, Radtail website um, obviously I was hoping I could get some spec information we don't like as if there's anything on there I've had a look in the manual as well but there's nothing in the manual about specs um, and its conformity there is a section here as you can see where it says description customer serve, reviews shipping and returns then specifications when you click there all you get is this um, four point bulletin thing so there's nothing else nothing else there now if you're going to downloads as well uh, I think under support and then use a manual download there's nothing there that I can see that would would give us any specifications um, so the RT 490 and Bluetooth programming. Yeah, this is a 470 though, so let's see if we can find anything for a 470. 470 English user manual, that's all they've got. Manual in Word format. Yeah, so there's nothing other than this uh, Ratel 470 user manual, which is, which is this, you know. So there's no information on conformity, specifications. Obviously, if a radio product were to be sold <clears throat> in the European Union, then there's a European radio di directive uh, which stipulates 
I think with some of the specifications from the ETSI, the European Telecommunications Standards Institute, where it would define spurious emissions. Likewise, in the United States, it would be the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission. Here in the UK, where I'm based, it is Ofcom, the Office of Communications, what used to be known as the Radio Communications Agency or the Radio Authority, um, which many years ago used to be owned by the Department of Trade and Industry used to be um, um, dedicated just to radio communication services whereas now it's post um, broadcast television and radio and media and radio regulatory services as well all combined under one department um, but again no matter which country you are in the world there will be a conformity a specification that governs the area like uh, Brazil, South America, etc., North America, Canada, Australia, every country's got its own regulatory authorities for type approval. Uh, and as we saw when we looked at the Motorola and um, Motorola manuals and the, you know, the Kenwood manual, these products that are made for the proper, you know, PMR, emergency services, sort of uh, industries. They've all got to have specifications and got to have been vetted and gone for testing at test houses and labs that in these countries that they're to be sold at so that they can look at the type of proven, the conformity and the specification so it meets the criteria of that country's regulatory authority. Otherwise the product wouldn't be legal to be sold in that country. And... Um, as we've seen here, you know, it's really important is that because a lot of people who are not really familiar with harmonic analysis would um, maybe think that some countries have been obstructive in selling products that may be um, a cheaper price point than products that they can purchase in their own country that are type approved. But as you've seen here, these radios are quite um, damaging really insofar as well, it's really an abomination to telecommunications on VHF with these radios because, as you've seen in the test that we've done, you transmit on VHF <coughs> anything below 200 megahertz roughly on this radio and it comes out with um, uh, harmonic spurious, the likes of which you would never know and, um, and can cause mass interference, you know, to other services, be it air traffic, uh, other emergency service users, PMR, you know, uh, all sorts of problems can, can come of it. Obviously if you're a radio amateur using, uh, using one of these and uh, you're transmitting on 2 meter amateur band and you're chatting away with your call sign, the next thing you know, you know, uh, I think we, we saw the first harmonic was in the military air band. I mean, you know, there's a possibility that chatting on one of these for too long uh, on those frequencies you're having a conversation with somebody on 2 meter amateur band, 144, 145 megahertz. Next thing you know, a Black Hawk helicopter lands in your garden with uh, some SAS types coming through your, your window with guns because you've just been jamming their um, communications on uh, military air band, you know. So that's the sort of thing. I mean, I say that jokingly, but I mean, it, it can cause substantial problems to... Um, military um, air communications as well as other radio services as well you know um, depending on what frequency you're on on the two meter amateur band obviously the harmonics going to move about as well so not recommended I mean obviously in this context um, it can cause greater interference to air, air traffic use than probably land mobile because the um, aircraft is obviously at high altitude the line of sight is basically straightforward as we all know when we listen to air band um, we can pick up aircraft from hundreds of miles away quite easily um, so naturally if you're transmitting on two meter amateur band and you don't realize that and you're giving your call sign and talking to somebody um, other radio users for interfered with can give that information to the regulatory bodies for further investigation and naturally you can draw attention to yourself about um, interfering with other radio services so it's really important I don't think people realise 
just how it is important it is to have radio equipment that is type approved that um, meets these stringent specifications and that's why these manufacturers like Motorola and, uh, and Kenwood and other manufacturers go to great pains and cost to make sure that their product conforms to all the relevant specifications in the in the world markets and it's so important is that anyway that's enough of me um, I hope you liked the video uh, you've enjoyed it and that you've uh, found some use out the video um, perhaps it's given you familiarity of setting up test equipment and how to do these measurements and also how to test radios receiver and transmitter specifications as well as the harmonic analysis side of things and it just goes to show you that uh, as good as a radio looks, as good as the features that it has, um, these radios are technically um, not permitted for use uh, while they're putting this kind of um, spurious emissions out. And I'm actually quite surprised that um, there hasn't been more work done by governments to prevent the import of them from China because obviously of the problems they could cause. Um, and, and again, uh, you know, the Chinese aren't doing themselves any any favours because if they're selling these to uh, their own population in China and they're all talking on these VHF frequencies, they're going to be causing themselves interference as well en masse. So it's in their interest really to solve this problem and, um, and get on top of it. Um, but as you can see, with the absence of no type approval, with the absence of a specification, it's a bit dodgy, you know, you can tell that straight away by looking at the product and its price point. And you know what they say, you get what you pay for, you know. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, um, radios like this, you know, cost uh, $5,000 and radios like that uh, cost a £1,000 back in the 1980s and early 1990s. And there's a reason you know um so this is what you need to think of when you're buying radios anyway i hope you've enjoyed the video thank you very much for watching and we'll see you in the next stay safe bye for now